to everyone joining us this evening for our latest Kahima Educational Trust webinar. We're just going to wait a few minutes till we get everyone on board. We're scooping up people from all around the world. I think about 150 are joining us tonight from the UK and uh, certainly from India and further afield. And of course, we'll be um, showing this to people subsequent to tonight uh, and we welcome you as well. It's good to have you all together. We'll wait a few minutes before Sylvia May, the Chief Executive Officer of the Kahim Educational Trust, introduces tonight's webinar, but it's very good to have you all with us tonight. If you're new to the KET, then a very warm welcome from me. I'm Rob Lyman, one of the trustees, and I'll be uh, helping out with the, the conversation tonight about a remarkable village in the Paktoi ranges in India called Panksha. And if you've been with us before, then uh, you're very warmly welcome for your second or third or however many visits you've made to these webinars. It's very, very good to have you. And we are excited at the impact that these webinars have been having over the last few months of lockdown. And as we go out of lockdown, our ambition is to carry them on where we can find sensible things to talk about in relation to the work of the Kahima Educational Trust. Well, hello everyone, and welcome to another KET webinar. And this evening we are going to tell a story, as Rob has just said, of a most remarkable Naga village called Panksha. Um, before we actually start, a tiny bit of housekeeping. We've introduced a new feature uh, in our series. Um, is that we've activated the Q&A button. So please feel free to ask any questions that you would like throughout the session using the Q&A button. Uh, if we don't provide a written answer as we go along during the event, we will answer them or try and answer them all if there's too many um, live at the end. So to Panksha. Pangsha is situated in a very, very remote region of Nagaland. Um, and Nagaland, for those of you that don't know, uh, or don't know yet, is a state in northeast India. One of the seven states um, that make up the region called the northeast. It is mostly mountainous and borders Burma on its eastern side. To the west lies Assam and to the south is Manipur. Pangsha is about 100 miles northeast of Kahima, right on the edge of the border with Burma. 100 miles of extraordinarily rugged terrain with 7,000 foot high peaks, steeply sided and covered in jungle. And as you can see, it is not easy to reach even from Noklak, which is the nearest town, and that's two hours away. Rob May, my husband, and I travelled there in 2009. Our friends in Kahima had, on behalf of KET, conducted an educational needs assessment for the most disadvantaged children in Nagaland and identified the area as one of the poorest and the area where KET might be able to help. Pangsha is in the Tun Sang district, where in 2001, literacy rates were just over 48%, well below the state average. Female literacy was also identified as a particular concern in these more backward areas, as it too fell below the state average. The village of Pangsha and its neighbouring village of Dan had one small mission school, which served a wide area children coming from as far afield as 30 kilometers north, south and east. Without transport, the children walked, taking many hours to reach their place of education. Without the means to travel back and forth each day, they would have nowhere to sleep with a roof over their head, which is why we were there and what we were there to discuss, the building of a hostel. The journey was an epic. We left Kahima at the appointed hour of 4 a.m. and 17 hours later, we arrived in Panksha. We had an enormous amount of support and help to get there for which we remain deeply appreciative. We certainly could have not done it alone. 
Particularly helpful were the cars and support team provided by the minister in the region as they traveled through areas which were, would have been impossible for us to do so alone. Stopping at various points along the way for refreshments, fixing a flat tire and a foot of mud, all gave color to the day. We arrived in the dark, but despite the hour and the rain, we were warmly greeted and of course, given a delicious meal of chicken and rice. The following day, again, starting at 4 a.m. with the cockerel announcing the dawn, I think he was let lunch later on, we watched as a procession of women and children in their ceremonial dress made their way up the hill, carrying a multitude of pots and dishes of food. Vera Heymendorf gives a wonderful description of this ceremony, which is extracted in Rob Lyman's book, Among the Headhunters. You can see here the ceremonial hornbill feathers that are worn and the few men in the center with mitan horns attached to their headwear to show that they have captured heads. All in all, I have to say it was one of the most memorable days. We were treated to a resounding show of singing and dancing, which our hosts insisted we joined. And here you can see my husband learning to celebrate Hansha style. And he will now take on the strands of the story. Before leaving Kohima, we were told that a World War II plane had crashed near Pankshire. I had asked if I could see the crash site. I was told there wasn't much of the wreckage left, as over the years the village had used most of it, but there were several larger pieces which would be of interest. When we got to Pankshire, we were taken to meet the oldest man in the village. He was 110 years old. I did ask how he knew his age. I was told that they use a slash and burn technique where they cut the jungle down and burn it, leave it for several years, then cultivate it. This is done over several acres in a four year cycle. I thought what an interesting way of keeping track of time until I was later told that sometimes it can be a three year cycle. So it wasn't a very reliable way of telling someone's age. He told us, that the British had burnt his village down twice, how he had fought the British, and sadly, how some of the villagers were killed. I asked him why the British had attacked his village twice. Headhunting, came the reply. Being a British citizen, I was glad my head was attached to my body when I got back to Kohima. He went on to tell us about the aircraft that had crashed near the village, and how men were seen floating floating down from the sky under cloth. The villagers met to decide what to do about this situation, and they decided help was in need. He told us of another aircraft which flew over, this time with men jumping out of it to help the survivors, and how other aircraft came to drop supplies into Pancha. The villagers will have benefited too from these supply drops, this must have been an extraordinary sight for the villagers. In 1943, it was all but cut off from the world, and they certainly had never seen an aircraft before. After these stories, the old man asked me to pick him up and carry him around his hut. He laughed hysterically. When I put him down, I asked him why he had asked me to do this. He answered that he can now say, that he had fought the British, saved the British, and now been carried by the British. We were then taken to see the plane parts that had been mentioned, still lying in the village. A huge prop was hanging up. We were told they use it as a bell. We were then taken to a piece of undercarriage, which when we returned to the UK, I started to research. My first thoughts were of a Douglas C-47 Skytrain, known more widely as a Dakota and used extensively in the Burma campaign. But on checking, Dakota's undercarriage is completely different. My, ne my next option was a B-25 Mitchell bomber. 
this has the same looking front undercarriage as the one lying in Pampshire and had a crew of five. I thought I'd discovered it. I started looking for any information about B-25s that had crashed in the Pangshire area. Whilst in this process, I found out that the US Air Force were flying C-46 Curtis commandos over the hump. The C-46 had been rushed into service and the early ones were unreliable. Pilots and ground crew knew them as the Curtis Calamity, Plumber's Nightmare, or alternatively, the flying coffin. Continuing my search for a C-46 plane, which had crashed around Pancha, with complete luck, I came across a Reader's Digest article extracted from Eric Severard's Not So Wild a Dream. In the ex extract, he described how 21 people bailed out of the C-46, 20 of them surviving and being looked after by the village of Pangshire, I found the plane. I immediately ordered a copy of Severard's book. One whole chapter in the book is dedicated to the plane crash and the survivor's story. I also found articles written by John Davis and John Nevin, the pilot. I discovered that the plane carrying the team who parachuted into rescue the survivors was the birth of what was to become pararescue. It turned out that this was their first and their most successful, rescuing 20 people. For those who don't know pararescue, it is a special unit in the US Air Force dedicated to rescuing military personnel. Their motto, the things we do, as others may live, is very apt. I took all this material to my father-in-law, Gordon Graham, and said that there is a book here. He read it all and agreed. The next thing was to find an author. Due to his extensive knowledge of the Burma campaign, there was only ever one person to ask, Dr. Robert Lyman, who initially didn't sound very interested. Thank you, Rob. Uh, the, the truth is that I was very interested, but I wasn't sure how I would squeeze it into my, uh, my working diary. But um, the more I became uh, informed about the, the story of Pancha, the more gripped I became of its story. And uh, we'll spend a little bit of time now just going back as far as 1936 to look at the recent history of Pancha. And of course, this is a story that Rob and Silver and the members of the Kahima Educational Trust and the Kahima Educational Society in Nagaland didn't know anything about. But Pancha in 1936 loomed large in the history of the uh, Eastern Hills of Assam uh, for all the wrong reasons. Pancha was a very large village. It was the predominant village in the area that was not administered by the government of Assam. And we just need to have a quick uh, history tour now to bring us up to speed with the history of the Naga Hills. Uh, the British Raj, or the government of Assam, it was, as it was formally constituted at the time, uh, began to move into the Naga Hills in the 1870s, much against its will. Uh, it did so because the Naga tribes, there are 17 separate Naga tribes, all with their own separate languages, conducted, or many of them conducted, aggressive forays into the Brahmaputra Valley uh, against the uh, developing tea fields of Assam. The people of the hills, of course, went into the, the valleys in order to gain heads. They were notorious headhunters and also to gain other uh, material things that they can't and couldn't secure in the hills, not least of all salt. Salt, money, slaves and heads. And because of these repeated depredations, the government of Assam regularly sent up forays into the hills. And one of the most famous ones being against the Angami town of Kahima in, 18, in the 1870s on a couple of occasions. A significant battle took place at Kahima where uh, the British subdued the town. And, um, and then interestingly enough, decided to leave because their ambition was not to administer the Naga Hills, but simply to put down raiding. 
Uh, but as the years went by into the uh, early 20th century, another number of factors impacted on the history of this region. One was the rapid movement into the hills of Christian missionaries, most of whom came from the United States, and began. Uh, these people began converting uh, the people of the Naga Hills to Christianity. Another very important feature of life in the hills was civil insecurity, the insecurity that exists between villages who, are, who feel threatened by other Naga villages. And this was a characteristic of Naga polity at the time. Large villages would grow and, and, and strengthen and dominate the smaller villages around them and dominate them politically and military, militarily by sending out expeditions to seize heads, capture people, capture slaves. And the stronger a village became, often the case was that um, instability was then engendered across the entire region. So to cut a very long story short, the story of the Raj, the story of the government of Assam moving into the Naga Hills was one generally in relation to, or in respect of the, uh, the request by villages, Naga villages for protection from the government of Assam. And in exchange for the protection given by members of the, um, the native police, which became the Assam rifles, a small tax would be placed on the villages. And the ink stain effect of the empire in the Naga Hills thus grew with villager, village after village asking for protection. This was done in the face of opposition from Delhi and London, who balked at the expense of the, uh, uh, the growing empire imperial commitments placed on them. Let's move on into the, um, the first quarter of the, uh, the 20th century. And one of the significant features of the administrator sent into the Naga Hills, the, um, the deputy commissioners, the commissioner for the hill tribes was in Delhi, the deputy commissioners posted across the hill tribes, um, one of the significant features of these people, members of the Indian civil service, a very small uh, elite of civil servants, were the quality and character of the, the deputy commissioners appointed, beginning uh, with a very significant man called um, Hutton, John Hutton, followed by a man called James Philip J.P. Mills, um, and, and others, including Charles Palsy and Philip Adams. These men were uh, administrators, they were concerned about securing the safety and security of the villages under their control. And as a consequence of that work, they became very, very committed anthropologically to a study of the Naga people. And these four or five men, uh, to, to these four or five men, we owe almost everything we know about the Naga tribes in the 19th and 20th centuries, and their legacy is quite an extraordinary one. But one of the problems, let's just go back to Pankshaw, one of the problems that we had uh, in the 1920s and 30s was this issue with very strong raiding villages dominating huge swathes of the Pactoi ranges and the other hills in, in, the, in the Naga Hills. Um, these raids caused instability problem we had in the 1920s and 1930s was that the British were only concerned about administering law and order in what they called the administered area. Any part of the Naga Hills that was outside of the administered area, i.e. towards the, the, the border with Burma, was not um, legally administered. But people like um, Philip Mills could not turn a blind eye to the terror created in the Pactoi Hills by villages, large villages and violent villages like Panksha. Bear in mind also that in 1929, Britain had signed the Slavery Convention, one of the significant features of the raids that one Naga village uh, undertook against another village and other villages was the seizing of children and women and slaves, individuals who would um, lived for quite some time often in the, in the Naga villages uh, which uh, had captured them until such time as they were sacrificed and their heads removed from their body. We don't have time tonight, I'm afraid, to talk about the, uh, the, the characteristics of headhunting 
that um, featured in these villages. That, but if you, you are interested in pursuing it, then you can read it in, amongst other places, my book, Among the Headhunters. Here's a picture of um, Philip Mills with one of the slaves taken from the village of Pankshire in 1936, to which story we now move. So in 1936, messages had been coming back to the deputy or the assistant commissioner at Mokok Chong, which is about 80 miles north of Kahima, uh, down to uh, Kahima itself, and also to the government of Assam in Shillong, that Pankshire was raiding violently other villages in the Paktoi Hills and taking slaves and, um, and killing people. Well, this, this violence was a worry uh, for the administered area, but actually it was very interesting that other villages in the unadministered area were also complaining about Pankshire, not least of all, a village called Chiang Mai, which is relatively close, you know, half a day's march from um, Pankshire itself. And Chiang Mai, um, was a Chiang village and the leader of the of Chiang Mai, not as the village isn't as large as Pangsha, but it was significant in its own right. Natural enemies of Pangsha had long been fascinated with uh, Britain and the government of Assam. And the Gayon Bera, the headman of Chiang Mai, Ching Mai rather, had sent his son. Uh, um, to Mokokchong to learn the ways of the British uh, as early as the 1920s. So there, there was, despite the fact that um, Ching Mai was in an unadministered part of the Naga Hills, there was a developing relationship between Ching Mai and the British in Mokokchong and Kahima. Messages came through in 1936 that despite the slavery convention, Pangsha was behaving arbitrarily, seizing people, seizing slaves, and um, raiding other villages. So the British uh, had a conversation amongst themselves and the government of Assam. Um, much of the conversation uh, for a punitive expedition against Pankshire being undertaken by Philip Mills, who's second from the right here, smoking his pipe. This photograph was taken at the end of the punitive expedition, uh, which we're going to uh, talk about now. But the conversation amongst the um, the Assam government officials was that Pangsha needed to be persuaded to cease its uh, raiding and its slave taking and its head hunting. And the only way to do that would be to demonstrate that it was behaving illegally and by, and to do that required significant force. So a punitive expedition, an expedition to punish Pangsha for its depredations uh, was necessary. Now, punitive expeditions had been undertaken a number of times in the past, not always successfully. They required a considerable logistical effort. They were undertaken into enemy territory. They were undertaken in quite difficult topographical circumstances. As uh, Sylvia has mentioned, these hills are rugged. Uh, they rise uh, between two and 3,000 feet in the valleys to 7,000 feet. They're corrugated, they're covered in jungle, they're very, very hard to traverse. But the decision was made nevertheless to launch a punitive expedition. And a raid was uh, a, a force of about 150 uh, Assam riflemen and 360 Naga porters were assembled uh, to undertake the, uh, the march to um, Pangsha from Mokokchong in November 1936. And I've mentioned the, um, the, the environment into which the uh, punitive expedition would be marching. Uh, these um, Noklak Nagas on the left are actually friendly. This photograph was taken at the end of the raid, and these men who were porters on the raid uh, were celebrating the success of the expedition against uh, Pangsha. The irony of this particular photograph is that many of the porters who were recruited by the British at Mokok Chong to uh, undertake the raid were, uh, were looking forward to bashing the Pancturites and taking a few heads themselves. So uh, that they, they, the, the nuance of going to Pancture in a, in a punitive expedition to punish the Pancturites for raiding and headhunting was certainly lost on these Nagas. 
And I've gone forward a little bit too quickly because I want to introduce you to uh, some other interesting characters here. Um, the, the man on the left uh, is, was an Austrian anthropologist, very famous anthropologist who ended up uh, in London for many years, uh, Christoph von Führer Harmendorf and it's to von Harmendorf. We are indebted for the photographs of the 1936 expedition. These are all available online there. They are remarkable um, evidence of uh, this uh, time in history. Um, the man next to him on the right was the police commissioner, um, uh, G.W. Smith from Mokokchong, and to the far right was the man who commanded the entire expedition, the, the, the soldier himself, who was um, from the 7th Gurkha Rifles. And these men were responsible for undertaking the mission. Uh, the top photograph, top right, is a photograph of one of the Naga's favorite weapons, which is a crossbow, um, often launched in an ambush position, and the tip of the arrow is uh, painted with a natural poison which causes asphyxia. The only advantage of the, if there is an advantage, is that the, the poison wears off, its efficacy wears off over time. Um, Philip Adams, who I'll introduce you to in a moment, was actually struck in the shoulder by one of these in 1943 and he survived only because the poison had worn off. And the picture at the bottom is of one of the Naga spears. I have one of them in my study now, uh, bought uh, as a tourist, not, not, not uh, and it was probably made for, for tourists as well. So here we have a, a, a punitive expedition of about 500 people moving through uh, wild and crazy uh, Eastern Naga Pactoi territory, um, in November 1943, no, no, 1936 rather. Uh, in his um, memoirs, Philip Mills ad freely admits that part of the excitement of going as far east uh, as they were going on the Punova expedition was to be the first white man to visit the Pactoi Ranges and certainly the first white man to come across Pancha. This area was entirely unsurveyed. Uh, much of the uh, western edge of the Naga Hills and parts of northern Burma had been surveyed by the Royal Engineers and the Royal Indian Engineers in the 1920s, but nothing had been done, uh, in, in, excuse me, in these very, very remote parts of, of the territory. It's such a long way that it took 13 days for the expedition to make its way across the hills towards Pankshire. Uh, but it got there, and um, part of the the role of um, uh, Mills and, um, and the expedition leaders was to demonstrate the power of the government of Assam through the villages in the unadministered areas that they passed through. So there would be no doubt in the minds of the Nagas that any further uh, bullying and headhunting and general misbehavior of the kind that uh, Pankshire had been getting up to would not be. Um, uh, looked on kindly in the future. And these photographs were taken, the three photographs on the left-hand side were taken the day before the punitive expedition uh, moved up into Pancha and began its attack on the village. Quite remarkable. Uh, wherever the punitive expedition, the troops ended at night, they built a stockade around them of sharpened bamboo um, in order to be able to um, defeat any any attack on their position during the night. What they weren't aware of until after this was that Nagas generally don't attack at night, which was a significant boon in favor of the expedition. Now the photograph on the top right is of the uh, Assam rifles in one of the three Kels, K-H-E-L, it's basically a suburb or a, a sub-village of Panksha uh, the following day when the punitive expedition marched up the hills to, uh, to Pancture itself. And the, the memoirs of the time from those who were there uh, uh, were that Pancture was a remarkable site. They saw a very, very large series of villages spread over a very large hill uh, and, uh, and the, the houses uh, went out of sight. So it's a very, very significant place, Pancture. The part of the, it was very, 
quickly recognized that the aim of the punitive expedition, namely to burn down the village and, and to, uh, to prevent the villages uh, carrying out their, their attacks in the future, would not be possible against the entire village. So a small part of the village was chosen, and it was this cal, the cal of Wenshoil. Now, I mentioned Ching Mac uh, of uh, Ching Mai, the village of Ching Mai. This is Ching Mac on the left, a, a, a friend of the British and the government of Assam. He had had contacts with Philip Mills before the expedition 1936, and Philip Mills had met his son on the right. Unfortunately, with the uh, uh, process of time, we don't know which of the two sons, uh, Sangbao or Tangbang of Chin Mac, this man on the right hand was, but they were both renowned warriors. Um, the, the son, uh, if this man is Tangbang on the right, was a very, very significant tiger killer and had also taken quite a large number of heads to his name. In 1943, it was believed he had taken 14 heads. So this is the, uh, these, these are the tribesmen uh, who were on uh, the government of Assam's side. And these two individuals here, in a remarkable incident, are uh, Mong Sen and we think Mong Gu, two of the leaders of Pangsha, who when they saw the expedition, the punitive expedition marching towards Pangsha, came down uh, in an attempt to parley with um, Philip Mills and offered up a small scrawny goat in exchange for Mills turning the expedition around. Um, Mong Sen, a very powerful warrior, uh, very, very well known uh, in the region. It's quite extraordinary that we have a photograph of him here, taken by Christopher von Führer um, was given, uh, was left a no doubt that uh, the the goat was insufficient um, to persuade Mills to turn around and that the objective of the expedition was Pancture itself. And then we even have photographs the next day of the uh, Assam Rifles operation against uh, Pancture village. Uh, and this is an extraordinary battle, in fact, which nearly went the Pancturites way. The troops moved up to um, Wench oil. Uh, the part of the village was burned, and during the withdrawal, the Pancturites under Mong Sen counterattacked with spears and arrows. Um, they were defeated under the disciplined rifle and Lewis gun fire of the Assam rifles, but it was a close run thing. And um, a number of uh, the Pancturite men were killed, and the, uh, but the Assam rifles managed to get away, and they moved back uh, intact without loss to not clack, which is, as Sylvia said, uh, about a two hour march away from, from Pancha. So that's the story of 1936. Here we have a village that was very, very dominant in the Pactoi Hills. It was notorious for its raiding and its head hunting. And it had just received a little bit of legal punishment on behalf of the government of Assam, who were attempting to persuade Pancha to desist from its its ways. And these are pictures that Christoph von Führer Harmendorf took of uh, Wench Oil ablaze. Now we need to leave November 1936 behind and leap forward to 1943. And Rob mentioned uh, earlier the, the discovery, his discovery when he first went to Pancha, unknown to any of us, of course about this aircraft that had uh, fallen over the, um, the, the village of Pancha in 1943. And I need very briefly to explain why aircraft were there in the first place. They were there in part because um, of the, not in part, entirely because the allied, of the allied commitment to China, uh, Chiang Kai-shek, leader of the Chinese government on the left-hand side, um, and uh, Roosevelt in the middle and um, Chiang Kai-shek's wife uh, on the right-hand side, uh, the Allies had committed to supporting the Chinese fight against the Japanese for very sensible strategic regions. The Chinese were holding down a very significant proportion of the Japanese army. The Japanese had invaded Burma, of course, as, a, uh, in, as part of its 
invasion of Southeast Asia in 1941-42 and had cut the Burma Road. All the supplies that had come until 1942 to China had come along the Burma Road that began in Rangoon, the port of Rangoon, traveled up through by rail to uh, through Mandalay to Lashio on the Chinese border and then thereafter by road from Lashio into um, the Yunnan, Yunnan province and Chongqing, Kunming and Chongqing. And um, the Japanese objective in the Second World War in 1942 certainly was to close the Burma Road. They got more than that. They managed to push the British out of Burma completely. But in order to be able to keep up America's commitment to the Chinese, they launched an aerial version of the Burma Road, which was very quickly called the Hump, flying from Dinjan and Chabua in the northern Brahma Putra Valley here, all the way into Kunming and Chongqing, a, a four hour flight over 700 miles over some of the most extraordinary mountain ranges in the world. Uh, because of the large number of uh, air crashes that took place, the uh, pilots and the air crew of the Hump airlift called it the Aluminum Trail. It was, at, to that date, one of the most remarkable human endeavors of all time, the Hump airlift. Over the um, three years of the Hump airlift from 1942 to 1945, early 1945, the C-47s, B-25s, C-46s, and, and, and other aircraft carried about 650,000 tons of supplies into China and carried back Chinese troops for training in India. These troops would then be involved in the opening of the Lido Road, which you can see there on the screen, from Lido down to Michinar in northern Burma. Those 650,000 tons, when you consider that a C-47 or DC-3 Dakota, same aircraft, carries about two to two and a half thousand tons, constituted about 240, the equivalent of 240 sorties every day for three years. And until the Berlin airlift, it was the largest airlift of its kind. And indeed the Berlin airlift um, was modeled on the hump airlift and the men who organized the Berlin airlift in due course were men who cut their teeth on the hump. Now, the story of the air crash, a large number of aircraft, uh, aircraft crashed on the route, some to mechanical failure, some falling prey to Japanese zeros flying out of Michinar, others falling prey to the terrible weather. In this particular occasion, a C-46 that had been rushed into service without being proper, properly um, uh, prepared for active duty uh, took off from Chabua and in early August 1943 and began its flight to Kunming. And on board were 17 passengers and four crew. Now, ordinarily, uh, this was quite unusual because most of the, um, the, the stuff that was taken in the aircraft happened to be fuel or or weapons or ammunition. Um, the C-46 and C-47s would take um, um, fuel, um, not jerry cans, but um, fuel barrels of, of oil and fuel. And this was an unusual flight in that it had, had such a large number of passengers. And not only that, but some of the passengers were quite extraordinary. We were only to find out when the Soviet Union collapsed that one of the men on the flight, Captain Duncan C. Lee of the, or, um, the OSS, the forerunner of the um, CIA, was actually a Soviet double agent, um, a man in the pay of Moscow. Another man who Rob has already mentioned was Eric Severard, who was a very, very well-known uh, American war correspondent. He had watched the Germans uh, come into France in 1940, and I had first come across Eric Severard's account of 1940 in his book, and reading further on, uh, had twigged that Eric Severard had actually been in the Naga Hills. John Payton, or Jack Davis, was the political um, attaché to General Stilwell. General Stilwell, Vinegar Joe Stilwell, was the commander of uh, American forces. 
in the Northern Combat Area Command, or the entire China Burma India Theater, as the Americans called it, and 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 the advisor to um, uh, Chiang Kai Shek, and also the deputy to, to, to Mountbatten, and then Bill Stanton of the Board of Economic Warfare. So we had an aircraft that was flying to China with some very interesting characters on board. The story of the flight is again an extraordinary one. In order to be able to cross the Pactoi ranges, which are about uh, up to 12,000 feet, the aircraft took off over the lower ranges in the north, flying along the line of the arrow to Michinar. So the plane first of all had to climb over the Pactoi's and then it would reach a flying height of about 15,000 feet. Uh, remember these didn't have oxygen and it was about the highest the plane could go uh, without oxygen. And then um, from Michinar, it would then turn due east over the mountains into Yunnan. On this occasion, and you can see on the map, the location with the little red arrow here or it is Pangsha. An hour into the flight, the, the port the left-hand engine failed and very quickly it began losing height and the pilot Harry Nevo and his um, co-pilot Charles Felix immediately recognized that they had to get back over the Pactoi ranges. They would make for the emergency uh, landing ground at Jorhat further down in the Brahmaputra Valley um, where they would repair the engine then go back to Chabu and try again. But because the aircraft was so heavily laden, it was dropping very, very quickly. And within a, a short while, it was realized by both Harry Naveau and um, Charles Felix that the aircraft would not have the height to get over the mountains. The only option now was to uh, what was for the aircraft to crash. And if the men were to survive, they had to jump out. Quite fortunately, there were enough parachutes. This was a United States Army Air Force air aircraft, and they all had parachutes. There were sufficient parachutes for all people on board. And uh, I can't tell you the entire story, you're going to have to read the book, but in the, the largest involuntary evacuation of an aircraft ever, and the, the record stands today, 20 of the 21 people on board the aircraft managed to evacuate the aircraft, the last ones just before it hit the ground, they were lucky to survive. And the only person to die in the crash was Charles Felix, the co-pilot, who stayed at the controls all the way to the end. The men who jumped out of the aircraft uh, had never been parachute trained, they'd never been instructed on how to put the parachutes on even, um, but they all survived. Uh, a small number ended up being looked after by some Nagas in a village called Ponyo uh, over the border in uh, Burma. But the others floated down very close to a large village. And of course, these people had no idea where they were. They had no idea that actually they were floating down over a village that was one of the most notoriously aggressive headhunting villages in the entire Pactoi range and a village that was way outside the control of the government of Assam and the government of Burma. And I was quite fortunate they didn't know that, otherwise they might have uh, undertaken some precipitate action when they landed. They didn't. And the story of the, uh, the, the landing is that within a very short while, as Rob mentioned, the villagers of Pangsha agreed that they would go out and they would bring in the parachutists uh, and they would look after them. Now, the villagers of Pangsha had seen aircraft in the sky before, but a long way up on the odd occasion that they had aircraft had flown over Pangsha, they'd been flying at a great height, 12 to 15,000 feet. And they had no idea um, who occupied um, these heavenly devices that, uh, that flew across the skies. And they wanted, they were inquisitive. They wanted to find out what was going on. But a subtext to the story is an interesting one. The deputy commissioner in Mokok Chong, the new uh, British deputy commissioner, was a very impressive young 29-year-old uh, member of the Indian Civil Service called Philip Adams. And Philip Adams, when the, uh, the hump airlift had begun, 
without extending his influence unnecessarily into the uncontrolled, uh, um, the, the uncontrolled area, the unadministered area, sent messages right across the Pactoi Hills that anyone parachuting in was to be looked after, anyone surviving an air crash was to be looked after, and they would be rewarded uh, by the government of India. And the reward was 400 rupees, a huge amount of money, I think equivalent even at the time to about 500 US dollars um, in salt and in, 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 um, in silver rupees, which was the de facto currency of the hills. So yes, the, the, the Pankshirite certainly had a, a, something of an, a, an ulterior motive when, these, uh, when the survivors of the air crash floated down on their parachutes. They had a reward that they were looking for. But of course, there was no, um, it, it wasn't certain that the Pankshirites would, um, would behave in the way that they eventually did. To cut a very long story short, the engagement between the survivors of the air crash and the Pankshirites was an extraordinary anthropological uh, one and a really exciting one. Um, John Peyton Davis, Jack Davis, um, left a fabulous memoir of his time uh, in, in his, own, uh, his own memoir. And uh, Eric Severard did likewise. And there are a few others, including Harry Niveau, the, the, the captain of the aircraft. This is fascinating. This uh, are the notes that Jack Davis took whilst he was trying to communicate with the Pancturites when they landed. A couple of the Chinese officers standing around proffered uh, um, Chinese and uh, other, other languages were offered as well, but the Pankshirites couldn't comprehend anything. So Jack Davis tried to uh, express, uh, or tried to communicate rather, by drawing. One of the things that really amazed Jack Davis was the, uh, the cowrie shells, the seashells that adorned the headdress and the accoutrements of the, the Pankshire warriors. So he drew a shark. He was which you can see there on the on the, the, the diagram. He, he was intrigued as to where these cowrie shells had come from, and he thought that they might be able to tell him. But throughout the engagement, they were unable to communicate with the Pankshirites uh, directly. But further help was at hand. Unbeknownst to the uh, survivors who were gathered in Pankshire uh, and were separated out by the Pankshirites, they put them, they built a little stockade for them were the uh, men of um, Chingmak's tribe over in Ching Mai. And these are Ching Mai warriors taken at the end of 1943. And a, a message very quickly got to um, Ching Mai from Philip Adams. As soon as the aircraft crashed, the Americans at Chabua began talking to Philip Adams to find out where they might be uh, what the territory was like. Philip Adams immediately recognized that they had fallen over Pankshire and um, special measures needed to be taken to protect the survivors. So he passed the message on to Ching Mac. Ching Mac sent his son Tang Ban and these warriors to um, out of sight of the survivors to protect the village and to threaten the Pankshireites lest they uh, be persuaded to bring harm to the survivors. It's quite an extraordinary story. And these are the, these are at least some of the, the warriors who came uh, to the rescue of the survivors, camping out on the outskirts of Pankshire, lest any harm come to the, um, come to the survivors. We need, need to now move on. The expedition in 1936 took 13 days to get to Pankshire. Um, a remarkable logistical exercise was undertaken by the Americans to fly um, supplies virtually every day to the, uh, to the survivors and to drop salt and other goods to the, uh, for the Pancturites in order to um, say thank you to them. That was quite extraordinary. And um, the, an expedition was arranged with, led by Philip Adams, which marched out uh, following the, um, the, the 1936 route and got to Pankshire and immediately prepared to bring the survivors back to Mokokchong and relative civilization and the relative 
uh, journeys are shown on the map, which is uh, taken from the book. The extraordinary thing is that the return journey only took seven days. And when the men reached Mokokchong, they were astonished to see a American uh, serviceman with a camera. What they didn't realize at the time was that this was a movie camera. And we're really lucky to be able to show you um, the, 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 the film that was taken at the time uh, and um, shown over the newsreels of the return to Mokokchong after a seven day march across the mountains and after nearly three weeks of being uh, in the hills of the survivors. And, and the, although the quality is very poor, you'll be able to get a, a reasonable sense of the story. And um, you'll just have to bear with the, um, the volume as well. Here we go. Above the wild Assam mountains of northern Burma, rescue planes search for 20 men forced to parachute from a China-bound transport. Radio signals sent just before the plane fell have brought the searching parties to the scene. They sight the lost men in a clearing below, a remote village 6,000 feet up in the mountain. Food and medical supplies are dropped by parachute. A doctor and two medical corpsmen also are landed by parachute to give first aid to the marooned men. Strangely enough, these primitive natives, once headhunters of the jungle, proved to be the white men's best friends. They fed and sheltered the stranded party until help arrived from the skies. For three long weeks, the natives led the survivors through the wild, uncharted country, back toward the India frontier. His leg broken, the bearded flight sergeant who sent the message for help is borne by carriers. These pictures show the party nearing the end of their journey. Theirs is a dramatic story of heroism and survival. Without that radio message, they might have been lost forever. Happy ending to a modern saga of the jungle. Well, all's well that ends well. Uh, there's uh, the only photograph I can find of the remarkable Philip Adams, top left, taken at Mokichong at the end of that remarkable feat. Um, I'll leave you uh, with a, a comment about the consequence of the rescue of the survivors of the C-46 uh, commando flight in, in August 1943, which is the creation, as Rob said earlier, of the pararescue organization within the United States Air Force. And it was led, first of all, by a man called John Porter, known as Blackie, John Blackie Porter, um, who sadly was to lose his life at the end of 1943, only a few months after this um, incident. Indeed, um, Sergeant Oswald, the man you saw on the litter there who had broken his leg landing um, in Panksha, also lost his life at the end of 1943. But the pararescue organization that was thus established was responsible for dramatically improving the chances of survival of air crew along the aluminum trail into China thereafter. And very large numbers of Americans and indeed uh, British servicemen owed their life to what Blackie Porter and his organization was able to create in 1943. That's the story then of 1936 and 1943, an extraordinary backstory to this village that Rob and Sylvia were able first to visit in 2009 in an attempt by the Kahima Educational Trust to, um, to build a, um, a hostel in the town. Little did we know then what a remarkable story it was. And I'll hand back now to Sylvia to be able to carry on the story. Thank you, Rob. And um, yes, our trip to Panksha back in 2009 set the scene for so much in the future. Uh, the writing and publication of Among the Headhunters being one, but it was also the start of the KET project, building of the hostel for children in Panksha, 
the building work we managed to start in 2010. We had selected the site when we were there and in 2009, and the elders of the village had all conferred and agreed it. Plans had been drawn up. Um, but first, we had to get building materials, and which had to be transported over 150 kilometres due east from Dimapur. This was an unbelievably difficult and lengthy process, and we take our hats off to all those who made it possible. The roads were even less navigable than the ones pictured earlier, and lorries could only travel for four months of the year due to the state of the roads and, and the rains. But they did it, and with the help of everyone in the village, you can see a couple of children helping to move the stones that had been delivered. Um, and the lorries could be unloaded, uh, materials stored, and building could start. And the hostel began to take shape. Uh, it was in 2014 that the project was complete. So it actually took us four years. But there you can see a, a shot of it from, from the distance. Um, I will say here that without the support and help of our team in Kahima, this project would not have been completed. It was enormously hard work for all concerned, and we remain indebted to them all. But in 2014, um, our then treasurer, Hugh Young, and his wife made the same journey we did five years earlier, so they could be there to cut the ribbon and declare the hostel officially open. And these are their photographs all the local children attended. The project took a long time, but we think was worth every minute. And we have successfully handed over the hostel to the village of Pankshire. And it is really good to hear reports of how well it is being used and uh, how um, valuable it is to everyone in the area. So thank you for your questions, which we're just going to sort through. Um, meanwhile, if you would like to purchase a copy of Among the Headhunters, please go to our website where copies are available. Um, they are available from all good bookshops, of course. But if you buy it from our website, thanks to Rob Lyman and his publisher, the proceeds will go to our work in Nagaland. Um, so the questions, um, Rob, shall I? pick some to give you i think really they're mostly going to be for you at the moment um uh we've had a question saying are the nagas unusual in the region um as they're headhunters which is normally associated with tribes further east yes the the, the answer is that there are enormous similarities anthropologists um not least of all um Philip Mills and, and uh, Hutton before him and others have identified significant links, cultural and ethnological links between the Nagas and other tribes, other peoples rather, across Southeast Asia, reaching into the Pacific Islands, the same sort of cultural mores and, um, and, and attitudes, um, which indicate that they had a common source. And the general belief is that the common source is from northeastern China, possibly 1500 years ago, in a massive diaspora out of China down into the into Southeast Asia. And this group of people found themselves in the Naga Hills, which is where they stayed. But there are some very interesting um, links between Naga attitudes, behaviors, beliefs, and Maoris in New Zealand and Pacific Islanders and, um, and people in Vietnam and Indonesia, for instance. Uh, I'm not an eth but there are some interesting um, relationships that have been identified by, by people in that area of expertise um, with respect to the Nagas. One of the extraordinary things, of course, is that the Nagas um, highly prize cowrie shells from the sea. They're as far from the sea as you could possibly imagine. But um, this is some deep link to their past where which they have carried with them over many, many hundreds of years. Thank you, Rob. Um, before I move on to the next one, I know that there's lots of you who are raising your hand. Um, would it be possible for you to ask your question either on the Q&A tab at the bottom or on the chat? I'd be very grateful. Thank you. Um, um, Philip Robert, Wood 
I'll just say Philip Woods has asked the question. Um, who, Philip, by the way, is writing a, an amazing book at the moment. Where I'm, we're all looking forward to it about um, uh, the, the work of the war correspondence during the Burma campaign. But uh, the, Philip, I'm really embarrassed to say that I've only just discovered, in fact, it wasn't me who discovered the, um, the newsreel. It was Rob May who told me about it several weeks ago. And even you know, when I was researching and writing the book, I didn't even know this existed. I know that Eric Severard had mentioned that he had come out at Mokachong and there was someone filming him uh, with, a, with a movie reel, but that's all he said. And I, so I knew something existed. And you are right. Um, Indian censorship, the government of Indian censorship was such that um, they really didn't like um, to release anything that was coming out of the of this part of the world. Um, but because it was Americans, they put pressure on the uh, on the British and this newsreel was shown in the in the war. Uh, and I can send you privately the link to it if you wish. In fact, we'll put the link on the KET website. Um, Good idea. And then the, Rob, there's the um, a question. The photos of the Chiang Mai seem to be very similar to African cultures. Is there an anthropological link? Um, do you know what? I don't know. I mean, I think there are clearly commonalities between the tribes people. The uh, I've made the point about the tribes in the Pacific. I, I don't know of any relationship to Africa, but it um, th there is some. Ex there has been some very very good work in this area, but I'm not an expert in it. I'm afraid. John Hinchcliffe. Hello, John. Um, John took me around Burma for the first time many, many years ago. Very nice to see you uh, on, the, uh, on the show tonight. Um, yes, there are lots and lots of crash sites still. Um, and there are only about, I think only about 70% of the crashes were identified. So, uh, and that doesn't mean that survivors were recovered from them. So a large number on the, the aluminum trail as the Americans still call it, um, are still there, covered over with undergrowth and, and probably will never be, never be recovered. And Philippa, hello Philippa, thanks very much for your question. You've asked about J.P. Mills' own description of the Panksha expedition, which was typed up by his daughter as the Panksha letters available via Pitt Rivers Museum, and I think KET. Yes, I think I'm not sure it is available from us, but it we know it definitely. Yes. It, it, um, it was it was made available with permission by the family when I wrote the book, so several years ago now, and I think for a while it I, I'm pretty certain it's on the website, Sylvia. Right. Oh yes, that's right. Yeah. And it's it's a remarkable read. It's absolutely fabulous. These men were absolute giants. Uh, giants of men. They weren't there as colonialists, colonialists or imperialists. They were there to carry out their duties of administering these territories, and they had a fabulous love of the Naga people with whom they lived. There's a wonderful lecture given by um, Philip Mills in the 1950s in which he described how anthropologists um, are best successful in the environments in which he found himself, and he said the only way to do it is to become friends of the people, genuine friends of the people. Uh, and that's something that these great names, Hutton, Mills, um, and Adams and, and others, and Jeffrey Archer, um, Trevor Archer rather, were able to achieve. Um, a very interesting question from Anne. Thanks, Anne. With the 20 different languages, how do outsiders and indeed tr the tribes communicate between themselves, ah, yes. which is an extremely good question. Well, then the, the, the answer to that is that they, a, a form of sort of Creole was created. These 70, at least 17 separate languages between the tribes, they're not dialects of the same language, they're entirely separate languages uh, amongst the Naga tribes, were um, a, a form of Creole, which is called Nagamese, was created to enable them to facilitate at least some basic language. and. When I first went to Kahima, I was quite struck. I was trying to understand what language people were speaking. So Kahima, of course, is, is, a, is an Angami town. 
and uh, youngsters learn Angami Naga. They also learn Nagamese to enable them to communicate with other Nagas who aren't Angami. And Mokok Chong, of course, is Ao and um, Chang and, uh, and, and a variety of other tribes. And um, Nagamese is the means by which Nagas communicate with each other. And then, of course, uh, they now speak uh, Hindi and English. So all these youngsters in our schools in Nagaland are all learning at least four languages. And I was absolutely bowled over by four and five year olds, very, very easily communicating amongst each other, um, freely from English to Hindi to, to Nagamese and Angami to their parents. Yes, and when we were in Pankshire and speaking English, I'm afraid, our English was translated into Nagamese and from Nagamese into their, into the Pankshire language. Well, it's, I, I'm delighted also to see that we've got um, uh, Philip Mill's granddaughter, Philippa, uh, and her brother listening tonight as well. That's absolutely fabulous. fabulous. You have every reason to be enormously proud of um, your granddad. I mean, he was a, an absolute giant in the hills. Absolutely. And Andy, thanks. We have um, had one scholarship awarded to a child in uh, Pankshire, but um, the Tun Sang district, we have a lot um, uh, from Knock Clack and then all the villages between Knock Clack and including Pankshire. Um, and George, thank you, George, for that excellent question. Uh, George is an expert in the story of the 23rd uh, Long Range Penetration Brigade, a Chindit Brigade in the Naga Hills in 1944, um, which Ben Brownless's father was part of. Ben is one of our trustees, and Philip Brownless was in the uh, in, in 23 Brigade. And um, George asks, was the empathy for the British Indian Army in 1944 based on a different set of experiences of colonial administration in the Pankshire area in the 1930s? I think that the answer is yes. It's quite extraordinary that for the most part, uh, Naga people supported the British uh, effort to defeat the Japanese or to fight the Japanese because of the benign administration, uh, colonial ad administration in the hills. And uh, the, dur during the war in 1944, the British provided under Charles Palsy, another great giant uh, of, uh, of these uh, Indian civil servants, provided rice and evacuation plans and security for Nagas who were pushed out of their homes as a consequence of the fighting. With town or villages like Pankshire, it was a slightly different story. And as you heard, people like Philip Adams had to persuade the Pankshireites to toe the line by offering them significant inducements. And 400 rupees at the time was an absolutely extraordinary, was a king's ransom. Um, so he judged correctly that their avarice would um, trump their desire to secure a white head on the post, the gatepost of Pankshire village. And, and they, they succeeded. The tribe in Pankshire is Chang, I think I might. I'm, I'm right in saying it's the Chang tribe. It's the um, Chang tribe, yeah. Yes. And have we finished all of the? I'll just look through any other questions. I think we have any more questions from anyone. Thank you for your lovely comments in the chat. Very nice, and um, I mean, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we wouldn't do it if you weren't wanting to listen, and uh, we love it. Um, big thank you to Rob because he's a, an extremely busy man, as I constantly say. We're very lucky to have him. Um, so thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I don't think there's any more questions. So we hope you enjoyed it, and we hope we'll see you again next time. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye.